thank you all for being here. And uh, tonight it's informational. We want you to ask questions and interact with us. Um, this is all just informational. Any decisions regarding your healthcare, medical um, treatment, anything like that should be decided with your healthcare team, of course. And I'm excited to learn about this patient experience research with you all. So with that being said, I will stop and I will go ahead and hand it over to our chief research officer, Dr. Darcy Flora, to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, it's good to see everyone joining. And um, I'm really excited to talk about patient experience research because that's what GRIT is all about. Um, I am trained as a research scientist, um, which you probably guessed by my title at GRIT. Um, I did my training at the University of um, Chicago and University of Minnesota. Um, I have a PhD in pharmacology. Um, a big question that I normally get, is a pharmacologist the same thing as a pharmacist? The answer is no. Um, I am not a pharmacist. I do not practice pharmacy. I do not dispense drugs. Um, pharmacologists are researchers, and um, we uh, try to understand what a drug does to the body, um, which we call pharmacodynamics, and then also what the body will do to a drug, um, which we call pharmacokinetics. And, um, and so that is where my expertise lies, really, in pharmacokinetics, which is um, kind of understanding how the body brings in a drug, how it distributes throughout the body, how it breaks down, and then ultimately how it leaves the body. And, um, and so I have spent um, approaching 20 years doing research anywhere from clinical, pharma, um, clinical pharmacology, where I'm running clinical studies, to molecular pharmacology, where um, it's kind of traditional, what you would expect of research, where you're in your lab coat at a bench with chemicals on the, on the bench and um, working with cells, that type of thing. And then obviously when I joined GRIT in early 2018, that's when I began doing a lot of patient experience research. Um, in addition to being a researcher, um, I should say, first of all, I'm not a cancer survivor, um, but I do have cancer in my family. So um, both my dad and his brother are prostate cancer survivors, both diagnosed relatively early for that disease. And then um, also have lost my grandmother to um, ovarian cancer. So it's definitely my family. Despite not being a cancer survivor myself, um, I do very much consider myself a patient. Um, I have a hereditary um, condition, which, you know, makes doctor visits frequent, um, having to deal with major um, medical events, and then obviously chronic effects that over time, um, as you probably all well know, get worse. <laughs> and so um, can definitely relate in many aspects. And then also, but it, it has opened up different opportunities for me. Um, I actually participated in a phase three clinical trial when I was 19. Um, and so that was really, even though the drug ultimately never got approved by the FDA, it was a very valuable experience and gave me the opportunity to really see um, science from a different aspect. Um, obviously, now I see the research side, but I've been able to see it as a patient as well. And then um, I've also had the opportunity to really run clinical studies that were really related to my own condition. So um, that has been extremely empowering for me and has really kind of helped to lead me in my trajectory to GRIT. And um, so as I said earlier, I've been with GRIT for three and a half years and was really at GRIT at the time we started our research program. And it's been really exciting to watch that grow. Um, so again, welcome. And I will pass it over to Dr. Dan. Thanks, Darcy. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I see a lot of faces I've seen before and hopefully some new ones as well. Um, I will give a quick introduction. I'm the chief medical officer at GRIT. Um, I have done many of the things that Darcy has done, but then also have, uh, so I've done clinical research and I've done the bench work uh, when, when I was in medical school. Um, I've worked on a, on a disease called episodic ataxia, which is a really interesting neurologic um, disease. And I've done kind of all across the board, but then I've also done the clinical research. And 
this at Grit, what we do is something different. So last week we met with NCOR and we talked about how to find a clinical trial and uh, how to get involved in research and some of the, the myths um, that need to be busted around clinical trials so that people have a better understanding of what they're getting themselves into and what they can expect. Um, this week we're going to be talking about patient experience research, which is a relatively new idea. Um, and uh, right or wrong, it's, it's kind of unfortunate that it's new, but it's also become really, really important. And people are finally recognizing the value that uh, bringing the patient voice into clinical research, but also understanding even after a drug is approved, how that drug works and what patients think about it and what that can, how that can affect the way treatment is done. And cancer is a really big area of this, of course, because it's a really big area for clinical trials. We're testing pretty potent drugs that have a huge impact. And so hearing what patients have to say is incredibly important. So tonight we're going to share some slides, uh, but we're, we're going to kind of, as questions come in, we'll go off the slides and answer them uh, face to face. We want to see you guys um, as well when we answer questions. And Lauren's going to be monitoring that, as she said. So you can just drop your questions in the chat and we'll address them. Um, this is meant to be informative. So we're going to talk about the history of, of patient experience research. We're going to talk about what it is. And then we're going to go into some examples that, of what we do here at GRIT. Um, and, uh, and Darcy's going to talk about some really interesting trials that she's uh, run over the past few years. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm going to bring up the slides and we'll get started. Okay, that's me. That's Darcy. So we're going to be talking about patient experience research and how your experience as a cancer patient empowers change. Okay, so what is patient experience research? Really important question. A lot of people don't really know. They think about this, and, and I'm going to put it into context for you guys. So if you think about like a product like dish soap or laundry detergent, for the longest time, people knew, okay, if we're going to make a new dish soap, we better add, we better test it with, with individuals, see what they think about it, see if they like it, see what they hate about it, because that's going to help us determine how to sell our product. In medicine, they didn't do that. Medicine never asked the people actually using the products what they thought about the chemotherapies, the immunotherapies, never really thought about it. Instead, they just assumed that doctor, doctors, who were the experts, knew everything that the patient knew and more and knew how the patient would feel about being on a drug and what the side effects were. And clearly this is not a good uh, assumption, and, but it took a little too long for the healthcare system to kind of come around and figure out that, hey, we better ask the people that are involved in, in, uh, in taking the drug what it's actually like to be on a drug. So patient experience research is everyone's attempt to fix this issue. So. I'll give a quick definition, kind of like dictionary definition. It's some of it's my definition. Some of it you can find online in various places. Everyone kind of has a different definition, but I think a really nice one is it's research that asks patients directly. Um, so face-to-face -face or um, going direct, finding the patient directly through a survey, through a one-on-one -on -one interview, through a focus group um, about their experience in the healthcare system. And it doesn't rely on answers from physicians or answers from anyone else but the patient themselves. And so what's really important about that is that you're going to be approaching patients with a different levels of education about their disease, about the treatments that they're taking, about the next treatment they might take. And so you have to come to patients with a really good understanding of what's going to be happening. You have to listen to them really, really carefully. And you have to kind of acknowledge the and what goes on uh, within a patient's life and what the day-to-day -day experience of living with a disease actually is. And so you can think about this in the treatment aspect. You can think about it in healthcare providers and understanding um, how it, patients interact with their healthcare system or with a, with a provider um, and uh, the day-to-day -day experience, as I mentioned. But in the grand scheme of things, you're trying to understand how, what patients think about the system and how satisfied they are with their care and with their healthcare provider and with pretty much everything that it takes to live with a disease in this country and also around the world. So. And Dan, I'll, I'll quickly add something in here. Um, so traditionally when we've gotten any insights, um, 
it has gone to the physician, the care provider. But when we think about that, we only spend so much time with our doctor. And so patient experience research is really trying to understand what happens outside of the doctor's office, because that's not necessarily reflected in what the doctor reports. Absolutely. And I'm sure everyone on this call can attest to the fact that you might not have enough time in your doctor's office to actually talk about an issue you're having. Um, or you, a lot of times it's uncomfortable to bring up certain issues with the doctor. So this is really an opportunity to gather the full amount of information. Um, a lot of patients also sugarcoat things with their doctors, unfortunately. And it's a thing that we all do. I find myself doing it. I'm a physician and I will sugarcoat my answers to questions I get all the time. And then I'll, I'll leave and I'll be like, uh, wait a second, I forgot I was a physician and I, I should know how to answer these questions. But when you're put in that kind of dynamic and we're used to that kind of social role of doctor patient, you, it's really easy to fall into it. So yeah, I, that's a great point, Darcy. Um, so I want to talk about a few examples of what this means and what the impact is. So this first one, patient-focused drug development. We'll get into this a little bit more later on, but this is a systematic approach to help ensure that the full experience of patients is meaningfully captured and incorporated into every aspect of drug development and evaluation. So this is really getting the patient input into the clinical trial, into the effect of the drug, and by asking them questions about what they think about their treatment, what they feel about their side effects, what they feel about the effectiveness of the drug. It's, you really need to understand all these questions and you can't get them from just the doctor saying, well, this drug was 35% effective. No, you need to talk to the patient. And so that's a relatively new development. And, you know, GRID is, is bringing that forward and trying to make that a thing that every company thinks about when they develop drugs, including the government, which isn't a company, but develops a lot of drugs or helps to. Okay, patient insights. These are unique refle reflections and experiences shared by patients with medical and research professionals. So this is what where GRIT kind of fits in. Um, we may not be running the clinical trial, but we're helping to develop the ideas that will be put into clinical trials. And so we're taking patient insights and we're applying them. And one of the ways we apply them is through something called patient reported outcome measures. Um, many, of you, many of you may have be familiar with these. You may have filled out uh, you fill these out at doctor's offices. Um, these are really, uh, they're, they're simple, straightforward surveys that ask a number of questions around a specific topic, but they're administered at various times. So you might get a, a patient reported outcome measure that for a cancer patient might ask you about questions about depression, for instance. And the goal is that you would take that patient reported outcome measure over a number of times of number of visits to your doctor and your doctor would be able, to be able to use your responses to say, okay, I see that your depression is getting worse. Let's talk about this in more detail or to open up the conversation with you a little bit more. So it can be used in a number of different ways, but we're also trying to make these a part of clinical trials so that it's part of the clinical trial. The doctor isn't just saying, giving you a pill. They're, they're giving you a pill and then saying, what, do you, what, do you, what has been your experience so far? You've been on this for a month and a half. What side effects have you experienced? Um, what, what things did you have you experienced that you didn't think you were going, that we didn't talk about at the beginning of this clinical trial? Um, what are some things that have happened that you think aren't related to taking the medication, but they're side effects you've experienced? So it, it opens up the conversation and it gives an, another data point that can be really important in understanding the patient quality of life while they're on a medication. And then finally, Things like satisfaction measures. I, I use the the example of like dish soap and dish detergent, um, and I did that on purpose because for a little, you know, like a hundred years ago, companies doing marketing knew that they should ask and should test their products. In medicine, it really didn't happen until the '80s, and I'll talk about the history of this idea in just a second. But there, it was paternalism. It was medicine thinking that it knew better than the people it was taking care of, and we're finally getting away from that. Um, I'm going to pause. I see that there's a number of things in the chat. Uh, I want to see, uh, Lauren, are there any, any questions that I should that we should answer? Uh, yeah, Kim asked about something that if I had to guess, you're probably going to cover very shortly in the next slide or so. Uh, so she's just asking about the importance of including the psychosocial impact of a condition or clinical trial, as well as the physical impact 
and kind of the importance of that and what it means uh, from the 21st Century Cures Act and the 2017 FDARA requirements. Yeah, it's it sounds like uh, you know you know your stuff. So we are we are going to get into it in just a sec, but this is really to your point. The way that the psychosocial dynamic medicine gets into medicine is one by educating physicians in medical school. But you know that's people forget it's it starts early, but you know it's really easy to fall into the, the healthcare system of medicine. So we need to have things like patient reported outcomes and patient experience research to make sure that we're listening to the people who are affected by the system and we're bringing those dynamics in, those psychosocial dynamics. So that is exactly what patient experience research is all about. Um, I'm going to jump in and talk a little bit about the history. Uh, unless there are, are there any other questions? No, nope, you are good to go. And the next thing Dan's going to talk about, um, he's very passionate about. So. <laughs> I'm passionate about everything, Lauren. I can't help myself. Okay. So, the history of patient experience research. We would all liked this number to be 1900, I'm sure. It would be great if 100 years ago, doctors were thinking about how patients felt while they were on their medications. They were, clearly, they want patients to get better, but they weren't asking them directly. They weren't saying... They were saying, just saying, you, do you feel better? Yes, no. It's more than a yes, no answer. And we clearly all acknowledge that, but it took a while to figure this out. And so one of the first times where the FDA and government and industry was really forced, think about this, was during the AIDS epidemic. Um, many of you can, are, I'm sure, familiar with kind of what was happening at that time, but the, the dynamic was that can, uh, clinical trials happened slowly and uh, people with AIDS who were dying needed trials to happen more quickly. So they went to the FDA. Um, so, well, actually, first they they picketed and and um, you know brought up reasons why this really needs to change. And then they went to the FDA, and the FDA finally opened up and had meetings with AIDS activists about the experimental treatment process, about getting more people into clinical trials, getting more people on drugs that might work. Um, however because there was not much knowledge at this point about patient experience research, there were some issues with this as well. So it was great that they got treatments out to, to AIDS patients faster, but I'm sure uh, many people on the, on the call here tonight might be familiar with the movie Dallas Buyers Club. Um, and that's an interesting case of a, of a circumstance where in rushing to get a drug to patients, um, a drug called AZT in that instance, that was pretty brutal and, and really had terrible side effects. People, they were they were dosing it at too high a dose, and they weren't really asking the patient questions about it. So this was an attempt to move more quickly, but without really building the structure in order to make these patient ex this patient experience question function better. So you got drugs faster, but they, at this point they were kind of nasty drugs, and a lot of patients had terrible side effects or died from treatment. And so we have gotten better since then, but this is kind of where it started. It started with patients standing up and advocating for themselves. In 1993, uh, a, a really important um, group, and I'm going to make sure that I, I want to read this exactly, called the Picker Institute. So this is kind of a think tank, a healthcare think tank. They came up with eight domains of patient experience and patient care that they thought needed to be focused on. Those domains were respect of patient preferences and values. Sounds obvious. Wasn't always. Um, emotional support of patients that doctors in, health, in the healthcare system needed to offer emotional support. Physical comfort, you need to be in a safe environment if you're going to receive care, you also need to feel comfortable. Communication and education, your doctor needs to talk to you at the level you're, that you're comfortable with and, you, and needs to educate you about your disease and about the treatment. Continuity and transition of care, your doctor needs to have a plan for you and needs to be able to send you to the right place to receive further care if necessary. Coordination of care, similar, you need to, there needs to be steps in the care process. Uh, there needs to be someone leading your care team, sending you in the right direction for to get different questions answered. Um, our healthcare system is so kind of subspecialized that one person isn't going to have all the answers in it. Involvement of caregivers, caregivers need to be in the room. They need to be, um, they need to be, be able to be present, be able to have their needs uh, handled as well. Um, they're an important part in the care system. And finally, access to care. 
which we all know is a huge issue and continues to be. Um, but, you know, this was kind of the, putting a line in the sand and saying these are things that need to happen and these are areas where asking the patient how they feel about the care they're receiving will be really important. Um, in 1995, the Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems was created. This is still an existing system. It mostly focuses on uh, people who receive care through the federal government, so Medicaid and Medicare, but it allows people to give input about how well, how good the care they're receiving is. Um, because it's it's a you know it's a smaller group of patients. We're not they're not asking everyone for information. Usually, about like three hundred thousand or so people a year fill out these assessments. Um, you can go and, and see the data from every year since it was founded in nineteen ninety five to now, um, and you'll see that you know it's it's the questions being asked are important, and the data is useful. But a lot of people don't even know that this exists, um, and it's. It's worth looking at. It's worth checking up on. So the consumer assessment of healthcare providers. And systems. Um, what else did I want to say about this? Hmm. Let's know about this. Okay. In 1996, you had the first drug approval based solely on quality of life measures. This was a drug for late stage prostate cancer patients. Um, in this, in the, in that circumstance, one of the main things that patients one is I want good quality of life towards the end of life. And so this drug um, was approved based on the idea that even though it may not, the side effects were less, but it offered patients the quality of life to be able to live their best lives through the end of the life. This is a really important idea. Um, we're still kind of grappling with end of life issues and this obviously in the United States, but in other countries, they're a little bit more understanding of kind of what these issues entail. And this was kind of the first example of really patients' uh, quality of life having input on how the drug might actually get to market. This has happened relatively few times. In fact, I think this is the only time it's happened. Um, but this is the kind of thing where we want to bring the patient experience in because patients are the ones who know their bodies best. So they can say, okay, my quality of life taking this drug was way better my quality of life taking a more potent drug that probably would only help me live a few days longer. So this is, a, this is an important example of bringing in patient insights into the drug development process. In 2001, the Institute of Medicine um, defined patient and family engagement, and they give a really nice definition that I'm going to read to you guys. So providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient needs, preferences, and values and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. Again, I, I wish this had happened earlier than 2001, that clearly there are a lot of doctors who did recognize this, but putting this out in writing and, and, um, and really kind of drive, putting this as the driving force behind proper care was a really, really important milestone in the patient experience research uh, history. And then the Barrel Institute is a really interesting nonprofit group. Um, they released an official definition of the patient experience, and they've done a ton to push patient experience research to the front of the pack. I highly recommend checking out their website. It's really interesting. Um, they've been doing great work since they were founded in 2007, but the stuff that they've done in the last 10 years is really, really interesting in order to push patient experience research and, and make it, um, make it a, a frontline issue in every part of medicine. Um, they define patient experience as the sum of all interactions shaped by an organization's culture that influenced patient perceptions across the continuum of care. So the thing that I love about that definition is one, it's applicable to all organizations. The government is an organization. Nonprofits are an organization. Corporations are an organization. Hell, I mean, a group of people can be an organization um, if brought to, if have, if they have a common goal. Um, so this, I think it, it brings the application of this type of research down to both the individual level as well as the large um, grand level. Uh, and it also talks about the influence that patient perceptions can have, that the perception, your perception of being on a medication, your perception of your disease matters to the treatment of your disease. That's an important, important insight that everyone probably had, but no one had really kind of put it down on paper, put it in writing and really forced the issue on it. Um, in 2012, 
um, to get to kind of finally uh, where the, the, the great question that I believe we got from Kim, um, patient-focused drug development. Finally, the initiative was opened by the FDA and discussion started to happen between the FDA and patient advocates and patient groups that could bring information and have an impact on the way drugs were developed throughout the clinical development process. So phase one, phase two, phase three, and, and after approval. And the impact that this had is still growing and we still haven't gotten to, you know, to, I think to the full impact, but what it did do is it put, it made it a necessity for companies to really start to ask these questions of patients as they developed their products. Um, and I, I mentioned, so this patient focused drug development, they started having these public meetings. Uh, the FDA started meeting with patients and bringing patients into the discussion and finally asking them how they, how they thought and how the design of clinical trials, the questions asked could be changed to better reflect patients' quality of lives. It's an amazing point and it's only been around for eight years. So at GRIT, we, we were founded up three years after that, but our goal was to pay, basically take this and make it bigger to bring the patient experience in different ways to bear on the way drugs were development, uh, developed and also the way patients were treated. In 2016, um, also when GRIT was founded, by the way, uh, the 21st Century Cures Act was enacted by the FDA. Um, and so finally, you had a complete redesign of the drug development process to make it more comprehensive, more efficient, and to involve that patient-focused drug development throughout. This is a really important milestone. It forced pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies to start to bring patients into the discussion if they wanted their drugs to ever be marketed. So this really, um, you know, this brought patients into the discussion front and center. I'm gonna pause there. I know that was a lot of information. Um, I would love to answer some questions before I pass it over to Darcy um, for other parts of the discussion. I think I have one more slide actually. I don't think we have any questions right now, but just wanna reiterate, if you guys do come up with any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat at any time. Um, uh, Jacqueline came up with a good point. Um, one of the problems with many research studies is that oftentimes the patient experiences of black people are not represented. That is a great point, Jacqueline. And, and you know, so one of the things we're trying to do at GRIT is really be as inclusive as we can with patient experience research. And it, it is a challenge. It is always a challenge because it really means building the conversation. And it's something that what we're doing at, at GRID is building health equity conversations, using that as a springboard to build trust in what we do and to build and to build education around patient experience research. And so things like this, what we're doing right now, our, our hope is that we can bridge and actually start to ask these questions more specifically of different ethnic groups within the United States, groups uh, with different sexual orientation, different different experiences and really bring those to bear because they're, you're absolutely right. They're not fit into clinical development the way it currently stands. And the FDA and the government are trying to kind of pull it along, but we all know that they move more slowly than we would like. Um, companies also, you know, sometimes move pretty slowly with it. So you got to kind of force them to be good sometimes. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to do right now. A great point, Jacqueline. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, you know, obviously trust is a big issue. And, you know, I know at GRIT, like our, it, transparency is so important when we do our research. And so, you know, we always are making sure, I mean, we will turn down projects if they're not with someone that really cares and is putting the patient first. And, um, but we want to be transparent with people about who we're working with, kind of what the goals are. And then obviously we try our best to do as much follow-up so that it's not a transaction and that we're really kind of building that relationship. Absolutely. It's so important. And I think it's getting better. Okay. You guys only have to listen to me for a little while longer here. Okay. So what difference can we actually make? What difference does answering a survey 
um, what does it actually look like? And, you know, what, what do we need to actually gather? It's actually, it's most of the time, this is a pretty simple way to gather information. We do things like use surveys and questionnaires, quick to make, quick to take. It's a really nice way to get a set of information and also to um, take what might be more qualitative data and, and make it quantitative. So a lot of people like to work with numbers, they listen to numbers. This is a way that we can take patient experience and turn it into hopefully something that can, you know, pretty quickly make an impact. But it doesn't, it might not grab the patient voice fully. So we like to do things like in-depth one-on-one interviews. We sit down with someone, we're able to sit face-to-face with them, um, so or Zoom to Zoom, and and talk to them one-to-one and and you know, understand exactly how they feel about something, but also look at things like their body language to understand, you know, are they, are, is a question that we're asking making someone angry and why um, it brings out different frustrations. It brings out a lot of different things that, that you might not capture in a survey. So this is something that we really love to focus on. Um, and it's really, really important to understand those qualitative viewpoints to get those quote, those patient verbatims that really explain the situation in a way you're just not gonna capture from a survey or questionnaire. Similarly, putting people in a, in a group discussion, putting a bunch of patients in the same room um, who are, are of different demographic, have different you know, stages of disease, is a great way to open up the conversation and to bring to capture some of the dynamics that patients have when they interact with each other. Um, patients may disagree. Uh, they may, you know, they may think that one patient may think that they were the way they were treated. Uh, was better than another and, and they may be on different meds and understanding those dynamics and kind of seeing how they play out is a really, really important and very, and very useful thing uh, when it comes to the patient experience as a whole. And then, of course, comp- more complex studies, which really incorporate many different aspects and look at them over time. And so this is something we really specialize in at GRIT. And Darcy's going to talk a lot more about our, our studies, which uh, incorporate what's called IRB or Institutional Review Board based research. And what that really brings is a much more scientific aspect. Um, And the idea being that you want these things to be publishable. You want them to have an impact down the line. You want people to go and find the paper or see the presentation at uh, at a, a poster presentation at a major conference and say, oh, I recognize this is a piece of scholarly work they're bringing the patient experience to the point where it can have a real impact on clinical trials, on patient education, on all these really important things. Um, Lauren, I see you came off mute. Are you going to tell me to shut up because I've been talking for too long? Or? Only because there's a question that um, okay. I already know the answer to, but I know you'll feel strongly and present it very passionately. Uh, Kim, who asked the question earlier, um, she brought up that uh, clinical trial sponsors can say that no uh, PED was collected and considered during the trial. Uh, does GRIT Health think that PED should be required to be collected and considered in clinical trials? Oh, absolutely. It's incredibly important. And I think, so there are a couple ways that you can get patient experience research into a clinical trial. I think the simplest one that has been moving forward is patient reported outcome measures. And you would think that because we've kind of, we've evaluated a bunch of, of of measures and different disease types, you would think that it would be part of every clinical trial, but it's not. In fact, I think it's only like less than 10% of clinical trials involve a patient reported outcome measure. So less that means that they're not looking at a quality of life metric. They're not, they're only looking at the effectiveness of the drug on treating the disease, which clearly is still important, but you also want to know what's the effect on the patient as a person. And so at GERT, one of the things we're trying to do is boost the number of trials and use patient-reported outcome measures and also develop new patient-reported outcome measures, especially for new types of treatment like immunotherapies and some of the, the latest cell therapies that we really don't know too much about. you got to ask these questions during development because if you don't, you're going you're gonna to have, have a lot of patients treated with something where you don't understand exactly what effect the drug has on them. So absolutely, one of the things we're trying to do at, at GRIT is make sure that this is a part of every clinical trial, but not just that, part of understanding the impact of the drug for a long term. And so, um, I, you know, I mentioned other ways to get into clinical trials, things like crowdsourcing the design of clinical trials, asking patients what they think about 
you know, how many times they have to go in for treatment, how many times they have to go in to, to get a scan, um, making it easier. So more of a patient focused drug design. Um, so can a patient stay home? And, you know, do they need to come in for, to get a scan? Do they need to come in for blood work? Can they, how can we make it easier to run a clinical trial and make it more patient centric? So these are all questions that we're, we're hoping to answer. Um, thank you for that comment, Kim, because it's, it's really, really important. Uh, I have just one more quick question from Lori before we move on, <clears throat> asking if some of this ever applies to post-treatment and having a survivorship plan for a patient, if there's patient experience that goes into creating things like that. Yeah, um, that's a great, great question. So when you think patient experience research, a lot of the time you're looking at like a clinical trial question. So thinking about the impact of a drug on day-to-day -day life. Um, there's this other aspect, and you're absolutely right to point out, which is downstream, what's the impact going to be? And the only way we can understand that is to ask patients over time um, to get patients who are at different points in their treatment journey and understand what the impacts and what, what's relevant to them at that point. And clearly, some, someone who uh, is a survivor and has um, had, had their cancer treated 20 years ago, but is now is living with cancer kind of the idea of a recurrence potentially hanging over their head, the idea of, um, you know, what effect their treatment has had uh, and through side effects and through other impacts, they're going to have a different experience than someone who was just diagnosed. And so you really have to understand each of those individual individuals well. And the only way to do that is to ask them directly um, is to say, you know, patients who, who receive this chemotherapy do really with this specific disease do really well, but how do they feel 20 years from now? Um, uh, do they have chemo brain? Do they hate, are they able to, you know, go up and downstairs like they used to? Are they able to go out for a run or has the chemo had an effect on their ability to do that? And the only way we know those um, is to ask the patient directly. So it's a really important point that patient experience research has an impact on survivorship. It can help us understand, for instance, this drug, boy, if you're young, I don't really want to put you on it as a doctor because I know 20 years from now, you may not be able to, to run anymore and you love to do that. Um, those considerations we only arrive at by talking to patients and following them over time. Yeah, and I should point out as well that I know a lot of what we've mentioned have been kind of helping with the drug development process, but some of patient res um, experience research is also focused on how do we develop resources to help support patients better. And so that's where, you know, a lot of the survivorship stuff comes in too, as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, Darcy, I'll hand it over to you ju in just a second, but I did drop a link in the chat. Um, I know some of you, if you're on Facebook, you probably got ads and emails sent to you as a cancer survivor uh, to fill out surveys from the American Cancer Society, who does a really, really big research project gathering information about survivorship and the quality of life and actually from the caregiver perspective as well. So that's one of the bigger ones out there, um, whether you feel great or not great about the American Cancer Society, but they are doing stuff like that and trying to make survivorship better. So uh, I think I can hand it over to Darcy. I will bring the slides back up. Uh, yeah, so I am going to talk about why patient experience um, is important. And so um, one key reason is because it, it's, you know, creating a positive impact both for patients and caregivers. And so according to the CDC, 90% uh, of um, adults are impacted by health literacy. So health literacy is um, a person's capacity to obtain, process, and understand health information so that they can make an appropriate decision with their health. And so um, I think, you know, most, if not everyone on this call at some point has, you know, been affected by this. And um, what patient experience really hopes to do is to try to identify these different kind of sticky points and tackle them and address them. 
And so um, ultimately patient experience research, it's making care friendly at every level. And again, like, as we mentioned, this starts at development when we're first thinking about um, uh, launching a drug and going into trials. And so um, it's important at every stage of this process, all the way till it finally makes it and is being used in the clinic. And then um, obviously it also really helps us to um, understand individual needs. Um, and this is where, you know, those in-depth interviews that Dan mentioned, these are critical for understanding this. And um, as you do more, um, you're also able to take away some key points and, and see different trends that are happening, um, which can then apply to these larger patient populations. And this is, where again, like the diversity is really key to get in there as well. Um, and this goes, um, you know, ultimately we're creating products and services that are gonna be more effective for patients. And um, again, you know, as I mentioned, not only are we actually potentially creating drugs, but we're also creating resources um, and that can't be understated. And then again, like through these different interviews, this is where um, we're really understanding disparities and, you know, where there may be barriers and challenges for patients so that we can better learn how to address them. But then on the other side of the coin, um, oh, another thing I wanted to add in there too is something that has kind of surprised me as a researcher since we're talking about um, health literacy. Um, I have been surprising or like a little surprised, but pleasantly surprised that to see how much patient or like participants in GRIT's own research are really actually learning about, um, or like learning just from taking surveys or just from us asking questions. And I think, um, it has really driven home the point too, as a researcher, it's our responsibility as we're designing different um, surveys and um, discussion guides to consider about how we can incorporate that learning into it. So and the other side of this is that it also creates a really positive impact for industry and um, regulators. And so um, it's expensive to develop drugs. And so um, a paper that came out last year said that when they analyzed data from 2018 to 2019, the average cost to develop a brand new drug was $1.3 billion. So um, a lot of resources go into one drug. And so getting it right is important. And patient experience is what's critical for that. And so, um, as it says here, is it prevents failures and wasted resources because you don't want something to go all the way to clinical trials and then fail. So again, it really helps to inform um, that early development of products and services. Um, and then once then they come to trials, learning how to, how do we design trials that are gonna be um, successful and really cater to the needs of the patient as well. Um, because if patients aren't willing to, and Dan, you can go to the next one because I'm talking about it right now, but um, if we don't design trials that, may, that are patient friendly, we're not going to enroll enough and it's not going to be a successful trial. And I think another consideration there, Darcy, is um, improving services. So um, understanding that when a drug is used, there's a lot more that goes into it than just taking the drug. There's the support services that are needed. There's um, making sure that the drug is administered correctly, that the patient knows when they're supposed to take it, how they're supposed to take it. Um, all these things need to be thought of and you need to ask the patient, how do you do it normally? And, you know, walk the patient through the process. So 
it's not just about improving the product. It's also to Darcy's point that she made previously, really about making sure that there's this net around the patient to catch and figure out how best to go about making sure that it's that it's um, not just getting the, the drug in the body, but getting it in the right way, and also making sure that the patient is supported through that process. So without patient experience research, you aren't able to do that. Um, and I think a lot of uh, drug companies of industry and government is realizing the importance of building these support structures finally, and really, you know, making sure that it's, you know, it's not just the drug that needs to come to market. It's the, all the ideas around it. How do you get, how can patients make sure the patients can afford the drug? How to make sure that access is the same for all patients. Finally, we're starting to think through these problems that are still really huge problems, but hopefully we can start to make some, um, some dents in this and really kind of get the problem solved. And so this is one of the ways to do that. Yeah, Sorry, I, yeah, no, actually, you, great points, Dan. Because um, another thing, too, that patient experience really brings out, too, is that every disease can be different, too. And so you have, like, certain cancers that affect more young adults and others that affect more elderly. And those those groups are going to have different needs. And so, you know, if you're defining, designing a trial and asking someone to travel that has young children at home, they may need help with health care or other different re- or not healthcare, um, childcare, um, but we need to start thinking or pharma needs to start thinking more about those different problems and challenges that may prevent people from enrolling into trials. And so ultimately then this research is going to lead to more successful treatments um, and even help out with the diagnosis process as well. And especially in cancer, getting the diagnosis earlier is one of the key ways that we can affect cures and better results. And so this is, this is a way to do that, making sure the patients, increasing patient education by asking them these questions by involving them in the process. It's, it's the same reason that um, a lot of studies have shown that care actually improves when you start asking the patients to become more involved because they feel more cared for. And that just, just that aspect of things is a huge part of medicine and the results are actually better. Outcomes are better. And I think this, this is a huge, and though it, you know, it feels, it feels like an unscientific thing to say, but to put it into numbers and see the impact of things of the impact of things like patient reported outcome measures, the direct benefit that they have just by asking the questions. I think these are the kind of things that medicine is still kind of grappling with how to involve. And so this is a great way to do that. And then the the final point here is just understanding or, um, you know, ultimately these insights are going to help us get new um, help for further development because you understand some of the challenges that um, maybe are faced um, from other things that may be um, approved. And then also, how do you better improve those services of products that are out? Um, Also, I, and this is because the pictures are um, hiding this on my screen. I forgot to mention the little stat on the bottom right um, about, um, about patient needs. And, um, it, and it says only 47% of patient needs are met. So this is from a patient experience study. And in this study, patients were asked if pharma companies were understanding the emotional, financial, and um, other needs related to their condition. And as you can see, the number's low, which just shows, you know, right now, traditionally, pharma has not been listening to the patient experience. And um, we're obviously hoping to change that direction um, so that they're better addressing those needs. So we also wanted to share examples um, with you. So I think Dan started to touch a little bit on crowdsourcing. Um, We can kind of think of this as problem solving. And so basically, instead of 
problem solving in kind of a more private environment, we're bringing the problem solving into an open collaboration where you're having both the public and um, doctors and researchers collaborating together to find solutions. And so um, an example here um, is in ALS, um, which is also Lou Gehrig's disease, and um, patients actually, um, so there was a study that came out of Italy in um, 2008 that indicated that lithium carbonate may help to slow disease progression. And so a few patients on um, patients like me, that platform, um, they, they designed spreadsheets and basically started kind of a, a little clinical study. Um, and they recruited almost 150 other patients to take lithium carbonate. Um, and some of them were on it for up to like a year. And ultimately they reported their results and um, found that the lithium carbonate did not actually slow the disease progression. Um, another thing that um, we've seen is doctors using crowdsourcing um, in order to find different diagnoses. And so um, I don't know if anyone has watched it. I'll admit I have not. Um, but on Netflix, there is a show called Diagnosis. And um, so they have some, actually, maybe Lauren, you want to speak to it even <laughs> if you've seen it. Um, but basically um, cases that they haven't been able to solve. Um, you know, there, there's one doctor in particular that has posted or um, after consent from the patients themselves has um, uh, put an article in the New York times and then got in different feedback. And so that's part of, um, I think some of the episodes from diagnosis cover that particular instance. Another thing um, is umbrella trials. And so umbrella trials are where patients that have a specific um, mutation or biomarker are, um, are found and grouped together into different treatment arms of a clinical trial um, based on that, those genetics. And, and so, um, in particular, NCI um, match, that's um, an umbrella clinical trial. I don't know if we have any multiple myeloma people in here, but in March, we had the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation do a program with us, and they talked about an umbrella trial that they're running, and that is called the Multiple Myeloma uh, Research Foundation, my drug. Um, so that's for myeloma patients, but again, based on genetics, they... Um, they put you into different treatment arms um, that target that particular um, uh, uh, genetics that you may have. So, and so then, um, are there any questions? We can take a little break. Um, there was a question from Julie about uh, research advocacy in the hospital setting. Um, not sure if you guys have any input on that, um, but she said, can you speak to how this work relates to the research advocate, a role many academic medical centers have developed, but this seems to focus on the patient experience for grant applications. Yeah, Julie, so um, I will admit that I am, am not as well versed in, in um, how that is, how that's progressing. Um, I do know that some of the, one of the hospitals that I worked at, um, they did have this role. And again, it was much more like you were saying, um, focused on generating, uh, trying to get money to, to, from the grant applications to the government to, um, and to other institutions to really pull in patient experience in, but in a, a different way. Um, it's, I think there are fewer grants like this available than there should be. Um, but this is another aspect and it's kind of, it's going to, it's going to the government side of things. Um, I would, I guess I would kind of position grid as kind of going to the private side and asking, Hey, you do things better on the private side. 
whereas the grant applications are going to the government and saying, we need the money to do this better on the government side of things. Um, I don't know if there, that answers your question or... Um, Julie says, yes, awesome, thanks. And you, I really think Julie, so you bring up an important point too, you gotta come at it from both sides. Um, you know, the, the government aspect of healthcare can be great in terms of providing a, a lot of healthcare to a, a large group of people, but it may not move as quickly as you'd like to see. So um, if you only approach, and what I found in my career is if you only approach the problem from in one, one direction, you never solve it. Um, and especially with healthcare, where there's so many different stakeholders, and so many different people pulling in different directions, if you don't really kind of come at it with different ideas, you're not going to solve it. So that's part of the reason we're here to try to do that. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, Darcy, I will send it back over to you to okay. talk about how to get involved. Great. So I'm probably going to just dive into this at a high level, just because I know we're, we're close to time. But um, so our expertise at GRIT when it comes to research is patient experience research. And so, um, you know, research takes some time. And so it's um, really some of our earlier studies that we've done in GRIT's history, where we're now kind of seeing how they helped out. And so, in uh, 2018, we did a project with Hodgkin lymphoma patients. And so we interviewed, actually we had uh, focus groups uh, and we involved 60 different um, patients and caregivers. And ultimately the insights that we learned there, they helped to um, form this Hodgkin hub, which is a resource center for Hodgkin lymphoma patients. Um, we also do, and, and so we kind of do two kind of main types of projects, the projects where we're getting kind of more internal insights um, into like drug development, that type of thing. And another thing, the other side of things is where it's a little bit more formal research. Um, this research will get reviewed by an ethics um, review board. And so they just want to make sure that, um, you know, the research is sound and that we are, you know, treating um, research participants well throughout the whole process. And so those type of studies are going to have a more formal informed consent. And, um, but then the ultimate goal is that these really lead to thought leadership type projects where um, we are presenting research at conferences, we are um, publishing papers and, this research is a lot more public. And so um, in particular, I've been really proud of the work that we've done in the Beacon study, which you can see on the right. And that is a study on looking at um, bone health education needs in patients that are at high risk for having different bone complications. And so this study we ran in 2019 and 2020. And um, at this point, we've been able to um, do programs with the participants as well as the rest of our community. Um, we've been able to provide infographics of in summaries to the participants. Um, we presented at numerous conferences and are working currently on our second publication to come out of this work. And so um, it's just really exciting to be able to share um, these findings with participants in our community. And I just want to add that um, the survey or the study on the right, um, the pretty graphics Darcy's talking about, um, this is something really important to me that makes me feel really good about working at Grit Health, not a shameless plug just because I work here. But like she said, we were able to do um, a program like we're having right now with uh, two of the researchers that uh, Darcy worked with at the pharmaceutical company Amgen. And they were actually there as researchers and got to explain why they came up with this, what they were able to actually learn from research participants. And I think that's really special because it's really important for everyone at Grit Health that, you know, we're not just saying, here, take this survey and help us and send you on your way. 
there's always follow up because I know me, I want to know what the heck are you going to do with my survey answers and why does it even matter? And I know that's something that's really, really important to both Darcy and Dan. So it's something I'm, I'm proud to talk about. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, Lauren. And there's a lot of different ways to become involved in patient experience research. So there are other companies that are posting surveys, but one of the things to Lauren's point that we pride ourselves at at GRID is really making this thought leadership um, bringing it to the experts, to other doctors to say this, and to other companies to say, this is the way you should be doing things. And this is how that can, um, how that really comes to fruition is to ask these questions in a really scientific way to pull really nice data and, and present it to the people who are making the decisions um, and try to get them to listen better. So this is a, a, um, something that we're really proud of and that we, um, do it, I think really well. Uh, it's kind of it's our it's our big thing. Um, anyways, how to get involved, Darcy? So the number one thing we have here is to learn to be your own advocate. Um, so it, you know. You have um, more influence than I think you realize. And, um, you know, every story that we hear is, is so unique and important. Um, and so it, it doesn't really take a lot to be able to advocate and share your experience. Um, And then obviously um, participate when opportunities are present. Um, so I think one thing I struggle with the most is that right now GRIT's not in a place where we can offer opportunities to everyone, but we're, we're trying to grow and offer as many opportunities to participate in research because we want to bring down the barriers of research, um, which to that point also, Never hesitate to reach out to the research team because um, we're happy to answer questions. Um, we always want to make sure it's, as I said, it's not a transaction. We want to support you. So if, you know, we're having a research conversation with you and we learn about different needs that you might have, that's one thing we really pride ourselves in too, is that um, we will follow up with different resources to help you out and can make those connections for you. And then also, um, you know, obviously GRIT does patient experience research, but there are other organizations, as Dan mentioned, that are also doing it. So um, you can definitely inquire within um, different medical institutions and um, research centers as well. And they're likely also doing a lot of patient experience research, it's becoming more and more available and then and, oh. Oh, Darcy, I just gonna, so this is kind of exactly the, the question that you asked um, that was asked earlier around grants this, this is happening in medical institutions now it's not all just about how how well does this drug work and running a clinical trial it's also about asking about your experience both at the institution with your physician that you're seeing there as well as your treatment over time so look for opportunities that pop up um, everywhere because they're going to be there. A lot of people want to know what it's like to be a patient because then you can, then things get better. And then um, we obviously also encourage if you are interested in research. Um, we have something called the GRIP project, which um, we hope to develop more, but right now is more of a registry. So when we have opportunities, um, you'll be contacted about that research. Um, but um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I also wanted to give credit to, we have a couple of people on our research team also in the audience tonight, um, and that is Sam and Rachel. And, you know, all of us are always happy to answer questions, and I have to give them credit because they helped Dan and I to prep for tonight. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Darcy. Uh, thank you, Dan. And like Darcy said, uh, Rachel's on camera. She'll wave to you. Sam, he's probably hiding. 
uh, but he is here. Uh, so thank you to the entire, I got a little thumbs up emoji. There we go. Uh, thank you to the entire grit health research team. Um, and, uh, you know, like Darcy and Dan were saying, you know, I, there are times you guys in the cancer community know that I'm kind of a wealth of information. I hold all the resources dearly in all different places on my computer and, uh, almost probably every single research study, uh, Darcy will contact me and say, Hey, you know, do you have any information on this? Do you have resource on this? So, uh, our team just really cares. Um, so even if it's in a research study and you're needing help, you're going to get the help. We're going to get you the resources and support you the way you need to be supported. So, um, thank you all for attending. Um, like I said, an email will be sent out to everyone that registered with this recording, along with, um, you know, various links, like Rachel dropped the link for the Grit Health Project, for the Grit Project, um, and then I'll include some other information in that email. And most importantly, a link to the third and final part of this cancer research series, uh, which is going to be happening on September 29th, which no offense, Dan and Darcy, but it's the one I'm most excited about because uh, we're actually going to be hearing from cancer survivors who have participated in different types of cancer research because um, you guys know it best. We've been in it. So we'll get to hear from them and what their experience actually was like in different types of research. So thank you again um, to the research team, Darcy, Dan, Rachel, Sam, and thank you most importantly to everyone who attended and who participated in the chat and asked some questions. Um, and thank you again. And I hope to see you at the next program on September 29th. Thanks everyone.